Welcome everybody to the, the Oregon, Oregon Fly Tires Guild, our, meet, our Zoom classes for this winter. Your presenter is Al Beatty, and I am turning the whole show over to Al. Go ahead, Al. Now, welcome to all of you on this cold January evening tonight. We're going to rotate your vice. I know that sounds just boring as heck, but we're going to find out whether you uh, understand all the different features your vice can bring to you. You know, Gretchen and I wrote a book about rotary tying you know, back in the mid 2000s. And the thing that was a driving force behind that is that we, we traveled at that time to a lot of fly fishing shows. And we were at one in San Mateo, California, which is just outside of San Francisco. We walked into the fly tying area and there was a row of tires from between the entrance and the theater where the where the featured person was set up. And there was about 15 tires in there. Every one of them had a rotary vise and every one of them used it for one thing, to look at the other side of the fly. And some of them didn't even do that. Tonight, we're gonna to learn a little more about that. But before we get into that, let's talk about the fly that we're going to tie. Even though this is not the main thing that we're gonna be focusing on, we're also gonna tie a fly. And to do so, we're going to need a hook a dry fly. And this one's going to be a curved shank. I'm going to use a thread. One of the things I forgot to get out was my thread, so I guess I better get it out right now. I'm going to be using some black. We're going to be using deer or elk for the tail. And the body hackle is grizzly or the color of choice. Tonight it happens to be brown. And the body is going to be olive dubbing. And yep, I happen to have some of that, so we'll be using that. The wing will be deer or elk. Again, I'll be using deer. The head is peacock, hurl, and hackle. And the, and the hackle will be brown instead of grizzly, but whatever color you want it to be. Uh, before we get into that, why don't you put me over to the materials and I wanna talk about one of the materials for just a moment. <clears throat> Let me switch classes while you're putting me over to the materials, Gretch. Okay, put these on, right. That's now, a good looking deer you got there. Yes, it is. It's uh, going to set that thread over at the vise. <clears throat> now, too often people run into trouble with when using animal hair. We talk about this every week, so it's nothing new. This great stuff called Static Guard is available at your local supermarket. It's in the laundry uh, aisle. It's for taking static electricity out of clothing. Women think it was for their clothes, but we know that it's for fly tying. Well, I've got a, I've got a big version of it, and I'm going to spray everything down with that right now, because right now it's cold. It's the Rocky Mountain West. And let me tell you what, there is static electricity alive and well in Boise, Idaho tonight, I guarantee you. <clears throat> I was making some dubbing the other day, and oh, it kept Jesus. sticking to me. <laughs> Talking about dubbing, I, was, I have a package of green dubbing here, and we're going to be using that tonight. But I decided to kind of sweep up the area where we had been manufacturing dubbing the other day. I got enough stuff off the floor and off the, well, anyway, off of everywhere to probably start a fly shop. Anyway, that, but that's the way it goes. We'll be using some dubbing wax as well. Jerry, Chris, I wrote a magazine article based on one of the things you talked about. And then you'll notice that the, you can pull that, uh, that uh, dubbing out of the corner of the package. Well, that's left over from the illustration that I did on one of your suggestions. It'll be in Fly Tire Magazine one of these days soon. When I say soon, that in the publishing industry, that's sometime in the next year. <clears throat> well, let's, uh, before we go into the actual deer, let's take a look at something here. Let's go to the, uh, go to this vice. And John, correct, I'm gonna let you tell me whether it's in focus or not. We'll make sure it's, uh, See if you it was all good, clear focus. Looks pretty good. John, thank you. Right now I'm going to move my focus fly out of the way. I'm going to put another one, a partially finished fly in the vise. <clears throat> and here's another one. They're both tied out of hair from the same animal, but one looks different than the other. First off, this one has a more slender profile this one has a more open profile. Which one do you like better? And by the way, there is no right or wrong answer on this. It is simply, what is your preference? Well, let's get back over to the materials and we're gonna talk about that, those materials for a moment. 
<clears throat> this is a picture. I know you've all been through this before, but I'm sorry, you're going to have to go through it again. This is a picture of a, of a white-tailed deer hide that I got off of the internet. Notice the dark along the backbone. Notice the lighter on the rib area. Dark, wings and tails, light spinning. And we're going to be doing both tonight. Set that down. And I'll show you, here's uh, two pieces of hair off of the same animal. There's a piece missing from, from between these two pieces that I gave to a friend. I don't know why, because it makes a really sorry image illustration when half of it's gone or not a half of it, but a portion. But anyway, you put these together and you can see that it's really dark up this area. This is up towards the backbone. And as we work our way down the hide, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter until we get down into this area. Well, I want you to notice one thing. All of the hair is lighter right at the base. But as we work our way up the fibers, it quickly becomes dark on the, in the backbone area. And when you get down towards the flank area, it takes forever to get dark. It's right up in this area. And yeah, you can use this for wings and tails right out on the very tip. And it works great if you're tying sizes 16s and 18s. But if you're going to be doing something larger, it's a bit of a problem. Well, we're going to set that down for right now because we're going to go back to that one that's in the vise. I like the profile from the backbone hair. If you like the profile for your stimulators out of the rib hair, use it. All I can tell you is that I'm a pretty fair fly tire. And just to put together this illustration, it took about three minutes to put that wing and tail on this in the in the vise right now. It took me the better part of 10 minutes of fussing around with this darn stuff that flares uh, when I was trying to keep that flare under control. So if you're having trouble with your hair, two things to check. Is it the right hair for the job that you're trying to do? And number two, have you used static guard? And an, an alternative to static guard is a dryer sheet. I think they're called, what are they called, Gretchen? Those white things you stick in the, in the, in the dryer? <laughs> anyway, it's an anti-static sheet. You guys know what I'm talking about. Oh, why can't I think of it? I can't think of it either. Oh, but anyway, <laughs> let's, get a, let's get a fly. I'll just give you an idea of the direction that we're going to go tonight. <clears throat> we call these our roadmap fly. You just take a look and you can see that this is the... This is hey! The, This is, this is the one that we're, we're gonna be tying tonight. And as you can see, I used the darker hair for this. Now I'm gonna get a hook and I'll just sit there. Sorry that about that guys, that I, the, the dogs were being naughty. Yeah, John got them all stirred up and then he, then he mutes and just kind of sets back and chuckles. I, I know what this John fella does, yeah. <laughs> We've got it. <clears throat> okay, well anyway. Let's see, let's get this black thread out. I'll just use that for now. <clears throat> I normally would use thread to match the dubbing, but we have a reason for using a contrasting color and we'll get to that in a minute here. But for right now, I'm gonna start by laying down a thread base that starts back. Oh, let's, let's break this hook shank, if you will, into, into pieces. The shank is from here and it's straight up from the Throw to the barb is the end of the shank. Even though that's got a curve to it, that's where we identify the end of the shank is right where my scissors are pointing there and right there where the uh, eye uh, starts to form. Anyway, I'll go back one third from the eye and start my thread base and wrap to the end of the shank. Remember, that's the area that's right directly below the part of the bend, if you will, that has the thread hanging right at the, at the barb. <clears throat> And I'll just go ahead now and wrap back forward. Now I'm gonna slip over here to my deer hair <clears throat> and cut out a, a bundle for the tail. And I want you to notice something here. One of the things we've tried to get rid of static electricity and in, to do so, we use static guard. What we don't wanna do in getting rid of our waste, this bad, these bad fibers and waste and short stuff right down in here in this part is to start 
trying to pull it out with your fingers because all that's going to do is a continually stroking in one direction will generate more static electricity. What I like to do is rapidly run my finger down this way and back up this way. And you can already see it starting to work its way out of, uh, out of that bundle of hair. Now, I don't want to get it all over the, the hair that I'm working with. So I'll just go out over a waste basket on my way back to the vise. By the and, way, bounce pad is oh, what you call those little dryer pads. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> OK, now what, I, what I've done off camera is ran, ran my finger up and down like that. And then all the stuff, it just works it right out of the, uh, the waste. All that waste stuff comes out. Now. I'm going to put this bundle of hair into the stacker and line the tips by tapping it against uh, the, the tabletop. And I'll uh, get ready just to tie that on the hook. <clears throat> I still have some shorter ones in there. I want you to notice I'm getting clear out on the butt ends and pulling those out. But I also gener I generated some static electricity. You see how that one stuck to the, just by stroking that bundle, what was it, two, three times I stroked it to get those shorter ones out of there? That already started to build up static electricity. So anyway, I'm gonna set that in place and I want the tail to be about as long as the gap of the hook. I want you to notice also that my thread is hanging not quite back at the starting point. So about two thread, two thread turns shy of that starting point. And that's because of a thing called material creep. And um, we'll explain that here in just a moment after I tie this on. Now, just a couple of loose turns and now I'm just gonna tighten up barely, just a little bit, just tighten up a little bit. Now I'm gonna wrap back a couple, couple of more looser turns. Now I'm gonna really bail into that. I'm taking the thread almost to the breaking point right there to bind that in place. And what I do by just using snug wraps when I first tie that on is it keeps it from flaring back and getting in all over my hands and just, all, just the mess. Now I'll take care of tightening those wraps up here in a few minutes, but now I'm just gonna wrap to the end of the, of the thread application, which is at the end of the shank and come back forward. Now I'll, I'll trim off the waist and I want you to notice that, that those two thread turns that I, that I uh, backed away from that thread base, when I trim this hair, I want you to you see a little bit of thread sticking out. Let me see if I can do it right there. You see that right there where the, where the thread base is slightly in front of the hair that I'm gonna cut off. When I cut that off, those stubs are gonna end up right on that, that location. If I had not done that, it would have creeped forward just a little bit. The next thing you know, Thread material creep will have you coming to the eye of the hook. You got a bunch of hackle to wrap and no place to put it. That's what material creep will do. Now these looser turns right now, I'm gonna take care of them. I'll just tighten right up over that, put them in place right there. I'm gonna wrap back a short distance and get some um, hackle I've already got pre-sized. Now, what does pre-size mean? Well, I want you to see how that, that, that fans out. Now, those fibers in relation to the gap of the hook are just a little bit more than the, than the gap, uh, about a, a gap and a quarter to a gap and a half is the normal for a size 10. Let's um, pull away some of the waste from the end here and I'll just find that to the bottom of the hook. <clears throat> Now you're starting to wonder probably that you said I was gonna talk about rotating the vise and I haven't done it yet. Well, that's because I'm just doing some straightforward tying, but we're gonna to get to it, don't worry. <coughs> now I need to put on dubbing for the, for the body. And let me find my wax. And I'll just put some wax on the thread. There we go, set that wax aside. 
I put the cap back on. I know you, all of you have already seen me more than once drop my wax into the waste bin and it sure makes a mess. Yeah, the corner. Yeah. That's the corner right there that, that's in the article for Jerry, but I'm gonna use touch dubbing and I, this works a little easier, just take the bundle out of the package. You see how that just kind of grabs onto the, onto the wax thread? Well, um, twist in a clockwise direction when looking from the hook down along the thread. And I'll just start wrapping at the front of the body area, working my way to the back. Now I know that I promised you that I would rotate the vise to put on materials. So I'm going to. In fact, I could rotate the vise to put on that body. In fact, I can rotate the vise and wrap the body at the same time and really speed up the process. And what I'm accomplishing is I'm checking the other side of my dub body as I'm wrapping towards the back of the hook until I get to this area right here becomes a little bit more difficult because I'm going to be running into the hook if I'm not hook point if I'm not careful. So I'll just kind of go at a, at a slight angle. I'm going to need just a little bit more dubbing. I'll just pull some of that off the corner here that we were talking about with Jerry's suggestion. And we'll just wrap that in place and finish up right there at the back. Now we're going to get ready to wrap the hackle. I'm going to use the rotating feature of the vise to wrap the hackle. And I'm going to place the thread in front of the feather. And just rotate, applying the hackle, working my way forward. See how e easy it is to get an evenly spaced hackle? You just hold your hand still and rotate. Now here's where you, a lot of people would stop, say, okay, I got to tie that off. So they would pass the thread over and tie it off. And you can do that. Or you can just drop the, you can just drop the bobbin and keep rotating the vise and it's tied off. <clears throat> now I had some people when I've made this demonstration in the past, discover that what I usually do now is I kind of tie this down and pull it, push it back. And uh, if I just do that, uh, I can run into a little bit of a problem in that the fibers right here at the point where I tie it down and get it back out of my way will, will point back into the hackle that I just placed. And it doesn't really make any difference. But if I take one wrap right here and take a turn over right there like that, and now I'm just come for whoops, I missed it. There we go, that's what I wanted. You see how that kicked that off to the side there away from me? It's sticking out here on, on the far side of the, of the hook. I want it there, it's out of my way, but yet it's waiting to be brought right straight in line to wrap the next turn and it'll lay perfectly in line right at this point right here. I won't have any fibers going back like that. Let me get my pointer and I'll show you what I mean. Let's see, here's the pointer right here. If I had just pulled this back along in this direction and tied it down, what happens is when I bring it forward, I'll end and start to wrap the next hackle. There'll be several fibers that'll go back like this. Not that it makes any difference, but if you're trying to win a contest or you're trying to pass your gold, silver, or bronze uh, for FFI, you might get a dinger off because you got some hackles going in a wild direction. Anyway, just let that sit back over there out of the way. <clears throat> Now I'll get back over here and I'll get another bundle of this hair. And again, clean out the, the waste. But I want to want to point out one thing here. And you know, it doesn't show real good. There's a, a definite curve in this bundle of hair and it curves in this direction. And I'm going to straighten that out a little bit by just taking my thumbnail and forefinger. Yeah, there we go. And that straightens it out just a little bit. It wasn't that, that bad out of out of a line. And now I will rapidly run my finger up and down just like that. You see it's already starting to bring all those fibers out without generating static electricity. But I'll do that over the waste bin. So I don't have a bunch of waste all over my tying materials. Now, as you can see, 
it's our I've got a clean bundle of hair and so far no static electricity unless I do something to mess it up. <clears throat> All right. Something's got to go wrong. It's just been going too easy here so for a while. I wonder I wonder what could go wrong. Uh, anyway, I'm stacking my hair. <clears throat> taking the hair out of the stacker. And I want you to notice that there are some of the fibers there that are still short, the shorter ones that I want to get rid of. But this time, instead of stroking them out like I did before, I'm just going to grab them by the butt ends and do a reverse of what we did before, just knocking those fibers out. And by working my fingers up and down, I get rid of them and I didn't generate any static electricity. Okay, now I'm going to get ready to tie my wing in place. I want to measure it for length so it comes even with the end of the of the tail. I've got one hair there that just doesn't look good. I'll get that squared away. There we go. <clears throat> now, if you just go to wrap this thread in place or this hair in place, you see how that pushes it on the other side of the vise? That's called thread torque. And there's a way to counteract that. And that is by taking a loop around the bundle of hair before tying it to the hook. So I'm going to make my measurement, but you see how far above the hook I am right now? That's so that I can, I've got room to make my, my bundle loop, if you will. And now it's just tightened up and it'll slide right down to the hook shank. You can see that I've got the loop around the bundle and now I'll just tighten it up and what it does is it cannot go anywhere but stay on top of the hook. Hey Al, this is Jerry. Yeah, Jerry. Um, one of the tricks I've, I've done with taking that loop around, around the hair first yeah. is when you bring the thread up to your side, make sure you cross over your thread and go behind that first wrap. And then when you pull down, when you first make that pull, it'll cinch that just a little bit without a lot of torque and a lot of pressure. And then your next wraps will continue to hold it even better. Oh, okay. Well, good. Good tip. Thank you. Yeah. You never know. It might end up in a magazine someday, Jerry. <laughs> With your name on it, too. No. Okay. Well, I'm getting ready to trim off the waist. And what I don't want to do is come in with my scissors like this and just chop it off because it'll just make a blunt cut and it does not make for an easy hackle platform to wrap over. And what I'm doing right now is I'm pulling this forward and making a severe, severely angled cut so that I can taper my hackle platform, which is going to be the head actually, all the way to the hook eye. You see how that all just kind of tapers down as a gradual taper to the hook eye? where if I had just cut that off, I would have a big hill there. And that big hill is what we call the cliff. It's a real pain in the neck to wrap hackle over. It almost always slips. Okay, good. I'll just get that to work right there. <clears throat> now I'm going to get out some peacock that I had laying over there. And um, I'm tying it in by the tip. I know you. everybody says you got to tie it in by the butt end, but I'm, I'm not doing that. What I'm doing now instead is I'm going to make peacock chenille while wrapping it from front to back, coming from the hook eye, climbing the hill, applying my peacock, going to the back. And you do that just by holding the thread and the peacock just together. Just hold the thread and the peacock together and it twists them together into a peacock chenille. In fact, it twists so good I have to unwrap some of it. All right, there we are. Now, there, I'm in a, in a place where I could do just like I did for the body and bring the hackle and the thread together and wrap them forward and tie them off at the front. You already know how to do that. So I'm going to show you another trick. And first off, I'm going to wrap my thread through that peacock, just further anchoring it in place so it's a lot tougher. And I'm going to throw a half hitch in here. And now we're going to talk about 
the bobbin wrist. Too many people use the bobbin wrist as just, they use it as a thread wrist. And here's what you end up with. You end up pulling your thread out of ways so you can rest it over the bobbin wrist. And then you rotate the vise to do stuff like applying hackle or, or whatever. Then it's time to tie off the hackle that you just applied to the front part of the hook. And so you take the bobbin rest out of the way and oh rats, this is too short or too long. So I gotta crank up the bobbin so that I can tie off the feather. So I get back to the working length of thread. Let's say that working length is about an inch. Or let me show you something here that might be of interest. Instead of having that bobbin up, even with the hook eye where an awful lot of people place it, drop it a little bit. Let your bobbin rest on the bobbin rest. And you see you're still in line. But the bobbin is, I mean, in fact, let me move it up. You can see it's right up here. Keeps everything in line. I can still rotate stuff. And I can tie off when I get to the other get to the other end, which I'm going to do right now. I'm going to pull my feather in line. You see how nice that goes in place there? And rather than mess around with all of this, I'm just going to tie it off with the with the vise. Now, you, I want you to notice that my Heckle fibers did not end up going, I didn't have three or four or eight or 10 or whatever going back like this. They're all in line with each other. Now it's time to, to finish off the, the fly. <clears throat> and I know all of you have been through uh, the good whip and the bad whip, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna waste your time with that. Just suffice it to say that to put on a good whip finish, you wanna start at the back of the head, work your way forward to the hook eye rather than the other way around. So, but I'm going to start at the hook eye, building that head and working my way back from the hook eye, pushing that feather back. You see how that pull, pushes that feather back? And yet it builds a really nice thread head. Now I'm going to trim off the excess feather. I'll set that down to use later. And I'll get my whip finish tool. Now I want you to notice that the thread is hanging at the back of the head. I'll lay my trap to do my whip finish and each turn starts at the back of the head and each subsequent turn is closer to the hook eye until I reach the hook eye. That makes a good whip finish. And it was a four turn whip finish with um, the last one right next to the hook eye rather than the other way around. Now let's take a look here and dress up all these fibers because there's always a few that get pushed back and I'll just uh, pull them into place. And there's our fly. Okay, questions. Let's see, do we have anybody chatting? No chatting yet. Nope. You just wowed them so much they don't even know what to say. Either that or everybody <laughs> well, you, signed off. That's what it boils down to. <laughs> you did such I, a good job. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, man, I'll tell you, this is so good. Uh, all right. Well, one of the things that we want to talk about is spinning hair. And then we're going to get into that. And we're actually going to use that other kind of hair that the rib hair that we were talking about on this. <clears throat> and often people when spinning hair will think they're doing a good even application. And then they'll look at the hair distributed around the hook and it will be, well, shall we say less fibers in one place than another. There'll be a soft spot, a weak place. It didn't get redistributed around the hook evenly. We're going to show you how to a fail proof way to get it to distribute evenly for you. Let me uh, <clears throat> get back over here and I'll put another hook in the vise. And this time I'm just going to use the same size hook, but I'm going to use a straight shank just because it's a little easier to keep in line 
for rotating. <clears throat> And I want you to notice that I have my vise adjusted so that that shank is pretty much on axis, as it's called. As I rotate it, it doesn't bounce up and down. If, uh, if it wasn't on axis, if I did this, I want you to notice that it bounces up and down, or I can even emphasize it more this way. You see how that changes? It's not on axis. Well, I'm gonna get back here where it will be on axis. Because that's going to be important for this type of hair application. Looks good. Okay, thank you, sweetie. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to start by taking my uh, black thread and I'll just apply that to the back of the hook, just the back. <clears throat> because I'm going to, do, going to do a Goddard caddis for you, which is just a spun hair fly. In other words, I'm going to spin a whole bunch of hair and then, and then trim it off so that it, it looks cool, I guess. <clears throat> anyway, let's get back over here now to our hair. And I'm going to be using the hair rather than this dark hair from up along the backbone, which doesn't have a lot of flair to it and is good for wings and tails. I am going to move down the body of the animal just like in this picture, from this area down in the backbone, I'm going to be moving down into this area. In fact, on this particular piece of hide, I would venture a guess that it's right from the animal in this area right here, yeah, but don't have the whole thing to be sure. But anyway, I'm going to be taking hair out of this area right here where it's all light gray in color. And that means light gray means it's going to flare. It's got, it's porous, it's hollow. Where the other is uh, dark means dense and it's not going to flare. And I'm just going to kind of pick that up with my scissor point, shove my scissors down tight against the, the hide, and cut it off. Now, again, I'm going, going to get ray out of the tips and get rid of all the waste in here, just like before, only I'll do it out over the waistband so you don't have the trash getting all over my materials. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, uh, that's all, all out of there, and that's a pretty good bundle, and I'll just trim off the little bit on that bundle. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is just flare this in place. Just take a couple of turns around the bundle and tighten up really tight. And I'm, you see how I'm working my way through the, uh, the trimmed ends there, working my way forward? That's because I don't want that. This first bundle does not, we don't want it to spin. And we'll just put the back slope of the body. That's the way we'll be going here in a bit. Now we're going to talk about spinning hair. And we don't need to go back over to the vise. I'll just quick get over there, get another bundle of hair, and I'll be back after I've cleaned out the waste. Let's see what. <clears throat> and I've got the bundle now clean the trash out of the bundle over the waste bin. Okay, and now here we are. And I'm not gonna use the rotating feature of the vise right now to, to spin the hair. I'm gonna spin it by hand and explain to you the process and what can go wrong in the, in the hand process, if you will. And I'm gonna see if I can mess it up. I've, I've, been, I've spun an awful lot of hair over the years, I got to be pretty darn good at spinning it without the rotating feature of the vise. But anyway, three turns, snug them up, cut off the waste. And now the process is, is you pull tension on the thread and you bring that thread around the hook, gradually increasing tension, increasing, 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 until on about the third turn around, it grabs that whole bundle and spins it around the hook. And if you kept everything even as far as tension as you go around the hook, it will distribute evenly. And the problem is that too often, my problem is, it's usually over on this side that as I go around, I relax slightly from what I do as I come forward. When I'm pulling forward, I'm doing, I'm doing a stronger 
tightness on the thread, if you will. And as I go the other way, it's not quite as tight. But anyway, this is the process. There we go. And I, I think I got a pretty good spin on it. I did. It's a little bit weak right here. And I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's, there's more of it across the top than there is here on the, on the bottom side. And we're going to use the rotating feature of the vise to apply the next bundle. But first, I'm going to take my fingers and just push that back. And I want you to notice also that I'm easing forward just a tiny bit from that. I want to have room. Let me let me zoom forward on this. Let me. OK. You see this where I advance the thread slightly in front of that spun here. In fact, it should come forward just a little bit more. I want to spin that hair right at this point, rather than what you think is right up tight against the previous bundle, because that can also slow down the spin. Now let me get another another bundle of <clears throat> of hair. All right, now get got the. Bundle here, I'm going to just clean out the waste, but I do that right over the trash can right here in front of the camera. Dumb move to make, but I'll do it. I'll be cleaning the camera up tonight. I can see that. I've got two more Zoom clinics tomorrow, so I it better not have hair all over it. I'll really have a problem. <clears throat> all right. Now I'm going to lay it across the hook just like I did. Take Two turns, not real tight, but snug, cut off the waist. Now, here's what we do. If I hold firmly on the thread so that it can't feed out, as the vise rotates, the thread gets progressively shorter and shorter and shorter, evenly increasing the tension on the hair. All right, so I'm going to do that right now. I'm grabbing the bobbin. And now I'm going to also pull, I want you to notice I'm pulling back just a little bit rather than straight down. I want to pull hold back, that you mean towards you? back towards the back of the hook. Okay. Oh, back towards the back of the hook. Okay. Yeah, and all I'm doing is just applying a little bit of tension there, but I've got my hand freezing that spool so it cannot turn in the bobbin. Now, as I rotate, we're getting tighter and tighter and tighter. It's getting ready to spin and there it's spun. Let's take a look and see whether we've got a good application. Looks pretty darn consistent to me. Well, let's do it again. Remember, now I'm going what to. What about that space that you left? That, we're getting to that. Okay, now I'm going to take a tool made specifically for pushing hair. It's called a hair packer. And I'm going to take and push back. See how I push that all back? And actually that space that I left there it was just a temporary space that I used to do my spinning in, if you will, if that's even a proper terminology. And now I'm going to advance forward just a little bit again. Remember that once I've spun the hair in front of the stuff that's already on the hook, then I will use this to push it back tight against the previously spun hair. <clears throat> Okay, and I'm just going to get out over the waste bin this time instead of trying to clean the hair out around my camera and have to clean the camera all up. <clears throat> all right, now we'll tie one in place. Okay, three turns, snug but not tight, cut off the excess. <clears throat> and now let's, uh, I'm going to lay my scissors down because it's awful easy in doing this to accidentally hit the thread with your scissor point. And uh, that will uh, kind of mess up the process. Now I'm going to hold that under tension steady. I'm not pulling on it. I'm just holding it tight so it can't do anything but get tighter as I rotate the vise. Here she goes, it's just about to spin. And 
there it goes right there. Let's take a look. Darn if it don't look pretty, pretty even this time too. Well, good. Some every now and then things will go in our way. It doesn't always screw up for me. All right, now I'll push that back. And uh, I've got I gotta have leave room for my hackle, but I think can push this back just a little bit more. Would you always use black thread or would you try to use thread that matches the I use I use gray thread most of the time, but I, I want people to see what's going on and I want to see the relationship between the thread and the material. That's why I'm using black or a contrasting color. Anyway, I'm going to do one more spin and this we don't need quite as much. So I'm going to do a smaller bundle this time. Also, I've taken this from a different part of the hide. All the other stuff was light gray all the way up to where I'm pointing with my scissors. You know, get up there. And this is dark from here to here. And that's because the only part I'm going to be using to spin is from here to here. So I'll be using some of that um, other hair for, for that. You get out over the waist bin now. And get, get rid of the waist. Come here. Paisley. All right, now this is a, a, a smaller bundle, and, but I want it to be just a little bit longer than what I've done before. In fact, I want to turn it around. If this was out right at the hook eye, this is a good way to turn around, spin it so that it's easier to build a thread head of but we're not doing muddlers right now or any of that kind of stuff. So we'll just do that. So too. Al, why do you want it longer this time? Show you here in just a minute, Sherry. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now I'm going to get ready to tighten this up and I will answer your question, Sherry, just uh, but let me spin this first. All right, here we go. I'm going to spin. And there it slipped into place and looks like it's going to be pretty good. Yep, a pretty good distribution all the way around. Now, here's the reason that I wanted to, I wanted to have enough room there so I could pull my thread forward, dress it back with my packing tool and pull on, I've got, I've got all that long stuff to pull all this back out of my way as I get ready to, to do a whip finish right here. And it, that's a, particularly important when you're going to do a, if I had done this right up next to the hook eye, like I was doing mugglers and I wanted to tie it off right at the eye, that makes it so much easier then to make that last spin with long hair, see I can pull that all the way back like that and it stays back out of, out of my way so I can do stuff like whip finishes and so forth, which is what I'm gonna do right now. If I can find my tool. Oh, there it is. It fell off its pin. All right, there we go. Cut this. Now, before I trim this and put on hackle, do we have any questions up to this point, Sherry? Uh, nobody in the chat. Um, before you finish, I'd like you to talk about uh, our supply chain for deer hair. And if we were gonna buy a hide, is there any advice you can give us on that because of the shortage? of choices that Blue Ribbon doesn't have for us anymore. So, okay, so Blue Ribbon is not your go-to guy anymore. Is that what you're saying? Well, because they haven't uh, been uh, supplying it. Okay, you know, my recommendation is start out by um, get online to, oh God, I can't. What Moscow Hide and Fur, I think it's called. Anyway, that's right. just do, do a Google search, search for Moscow, and that's Moscow, Idaho, M-O-S-C-O-W, mm -hmm. Moscow Hide and Fur, 
And I'm pretty sure that will give you the website. I think it's MoscowHeidenFur.com, but I can't say that for sure. But, the, but a Google search, search for that will get you to their website. And in fact, that picture that I showed you just a little bit ago, this guy right here of the, of the hide, uh, that was one that was for sale um, just a couple of weeks ago uh, on Moscow Hide. And the only thing you don't know when you're buying something like that is whether the animal was drugged 10 miles before it was before it was um, skinned and you don't know the, what what kind of condition the hair will be in uh, but you know you can you can call those people and find out you know is it uh oh, high Al, this is this is dick Rubaugh. what yeah, sherry's dick. what sherry's talking about is when uh craig matthews owned the blue ribbon he used to go to moscow hide and fur every year and pick out hides cut them up and and make material available that way but the new owner is not doing that and as a result there's no really good quality hair anymore at blue ribbon uh craig had recommended to me that we go to to moscow uh looking for hide he also said you might want to look for tanneries in your own area which I'm in the process of doing. Oh, okay. So have yes. you have you tried Moscow? I haven't, but if I don't find anything locally, I'll head over there. Uh, what what about Steve Knert? Uh, yeah. Okay, we've got Plan B, and okay. uh, <laughs> Plan B is Rocky Mountain dubbing in Lander, Wyoming. You just do a Google search for that. Now, Steve's business is. <clears throat> buying hides, processing them for fly tying materials. And he, like Wapsi, is one of the two in the United States that practically every piece of hair sold everywhere is either done by Wapsi or by Rocky Mountain Dubbing and then branded in packages for Cabela's, for Joe's Fly Shop, for XYZ, whatever. They, they're they a, a, a place that processes hides and, and, and brands it for whomever. Good that's, tip. That's another plan. Good tip. Yeah, and uh, you might find them too. Uh, they're called Rocky Mountain Dubbing slash the Tannery because it's a it's a two part business. And I got it, if you've ever been there, we went there to I don't remember what the reason was. And Steve said, "Well, we just got our load of white tailed deer hides in." Oh, you know, I was thinking this couple three white tailed deer hides. We went out in this warehouse. He had 500 white-tailed deer hides he had gotten. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Another time I called him, I said, Steve, I've been trying to get you. He says, well, I was off in Turkmenistan or wherever the heck. One of those stands over there in another country. And it, it, it ended with Stan. He says, it's the best place to get calf tails. Oh, really? Yeah, he says, I got 10,000 of them. Oh, well, good. You got Anyway, he always had lots of good calf tail, good quality calf tail for the fly tying industry. And, you know, so... That's, that's a good source, as well as Moscow Hide. I don't know if you're going to be, Wapsie in, in Mountain Home, Arkansas, also does the same thing that the tannery, or that the Rocky Mountain Dubbing does, as far as is processing for other people. But I know that Rocky Mountain will sell to the public, and I'm not sure about Wapsie. I don't think, the last I checked with Tom Schmucker at Wapsie, they were not selling to the public. They'd sell the commercial tires if you had the proper tax ID information and you bought a big enough quantity, which is a thousand dollars worth of hair, probably more than most people would want in their lifetime. And that's, it's usually a minimum order. Yeah. Hey, this morning I got uh, the Blue Ribbon Fly Shop. They had a, a piece in their newsletter today that they were getting hides in in two weeks or something like that. that. That's good information. That's, that's, that's new that's information. That's more current than I, anything I just gave you. I gave you a whole bunch of stuff that, that are maybes. It sounds to me like there's a good option right there. And the other thing yeah. is, is I don't have to worry about it because Chris Helm was a dear, <laughs> dear friend of mine back when, and he was the third person in the United States that processed hides and sold them. And he, his was the primo best that there yeah. was possible. And well, Chris pa passed away a few years ago. But I managed to get a couple of hides from him, and we've got oh, probably about a third of the last hide still in inventory. And given that we're not tying the same quantity of commercial stuff as we 
have in the past that it's more than enough to last for our lifetime. And, and we have lots of elk. And we have lots of elk too. Yeah, we've got a couple of hides of elk. <clears throat> I found a hide at the fly tackle dealer show that we didn't really need. But, she, but it was so pretty, <laughs> I had to have it. She had to, yeah, she had to have it. <clears throat> Anyway, the other source that I'm using now is is Nature Spirit. I think that they they have a great product. Nature Spirit. Yep. Yep. They're out of um, just up upstream from Lewiston. Okay, and I'm not familiar with those, so I'll, I'll Nature Spirit sounds like a good uh, good plan, and don't know anything about them. <clears throat> well, we've carried that at the Fly Fisher's place and sisters, and. Uh, it has worked really well for me over the years, but um, having blue ribbon flies, so you can put your hands on all of those hides and pick through them. And, and some of the things that you're telling us about for deer hides is really important to be able to choose the right one. We can't do that if it's online. That, that's very true. But the other side of the coin is when you walk into a fly shop with the information I've given you, when you walk into a fly shop, you're going to see three by five packages hanging on a pegboard display. Why? Because Wapsie made them or Rocky Mountain W and yeah. Lander, Wyoming made them and then put the brand on for whomever. And now you know what to look for. If it's all light colored, you sure as the devil don't want to tie wolves and humpies with it. You want that for muddlers and put in the fly that I, I'm working on right now. <clears throat> okay. Are we ready to go back to trimming this guy or do we want to sit here and shoot the breeze? I think you all know how to trim hair. Go. Oh. Okay, go it is. Excuse me, excuse me, Pace. Okay. Uh, run me back to the vice of woods, sweetheart. Okay. All right. Trimming hair with a rotary vice is really just a walk in the park. All you got to do is, first off, Notice all these long ones here that I just kind of push them back out of my way. I'm going to start by making a trim flat along the bottom, right along the shank. And I'll flatten it just a little bit more. I'm sorry, the side nearest you, you won't be able to see too, too good, but that's, I think you'll be able to see a little bit better right now. Let me get, get my little brick. Pardon me? Looks good. Okay, great. Now I want you to notice that I'm kind of cleaning that out so it doesn't get so bad. This brush right here, you get it at the chef's store. It's a basting brush for, for uh, well, chefs use it to baste meat and so forth when they're doing whatever they do when they put baste on things. But anyway, this basting brush is the best thing for cleaning up this kind of stuff, again, without generating static electricity. So I'll leave my brush down. Now, I'm going to tilt my scissors at an angle like this, and I'm gonna make all the rest of my cuts as I rotate the vise. Turn, each time I turn, I'm making another clip. Okay, and that's, oops, I got one that's got to get me kind of wild. There we go. That's my Goddard caddis. Now I just need to put some hackle on it. Now, one of the things that I, I used to tie dozens of these things, Jesus, I, I can't tell you how many, but a lot, for the uh, River's Edge and Bozeman <clears throat> was the ones that usually, usually bought them. And the actual uh, pattern calls for antenna and the way we would do it is to strip our hackle like this and then you tie two hackles in with the stem sticking out like that and that's how you got your antenna the first thing a guy does when he walks out of the door is takes his nippers and cuts that off because those diamond antenna will just screw up more leaders and like uh, you you can't imagine what a mess it will make out of your out of your leaders. So if you're tying them for a fly shop, well then do whatever you got to to make the shop happy with the antenna. If you're tying them for yourself, don't put the antenna on. You'll be cutting them off or you'll be fixing up a real snarl in your in your uh, leader. Okay. <clears throat> now let me get 
couple of hackles here. I happen to have some others sized. <clears throat> you know, does let me ask a dumb question and don't be afraid to raise your hand or say something. Does anybody not know what I mean by sizing my hackle? And if you don't, we're going to go through that so that it's because it's real easy to real easy to explain. I think this group probably knows. I think this group is pretty skookum, but I just wanted to make sure because every now and then, don't be afraid to say something because there, there are no bad questions. It's except the ones that aren't asked. Okay, I'm going to get a couple of feathers out here. And I'm not going to put on antenna. I hate those things. Every guy I know just cringes. I love fishing the Goddard Caddis. I don't know. The guy that dreamed it up was, was dreaming it up because it looked like a good deal. Didn't think about the fact that it was going to be such a pain in the neck to, to deal with. What about that fluttering caddis that I tie with the antennas? Would it be a problem with it too? Yeah, we cut those off too. All those so pretty with the antennas. I know they're just they're just gorgeous, but that's the catch customers. <clears throat> that's a fluttering stone, isn't it? That I yeah, about. fluttering stone. Yep. All right. Now I'm going to throw in a half hitch. Remember, I want my thread to working length. I'm going to bring my bobbin around here. And I'm just going to do one hackle first. Now this one's really short, and I'm going to see if I can get lucky and do it without having to have hackle pliers by using the rotating feature of the vise. Let's see if this is going to work. Well, so far, I'll drop that, tie it off, another turn of thread, another turn of thread. And I think I'll uh, throw a half hitch in there just to be sure that I don't mess it up when I do the second one. I normally would do this with just the one long saddle, but there we go. Now we're going to do a second one. that went clear back. Okay, now I'm going to drop and tie it off. Push the uh, bobbin rest out of the way because it's not a it's not a thread rest, it's a bobbin rest. And I'll just tie these off, pull them back. We're at my jam knot thread head combination. And I'll get my whip finish tool and do a good whip. Uh, two, three, uh, three turns is enough. Hang that up. All right, and there's your Goddard caddis minus, minus the, uh, the antenna. Any questions? I got a picture of it. <laughs> Where? I took it with my phone. <laughs> oh, I can go back there if you want another picture, Sherry. Oh Would yeah, like that'd be good because I've got your um, I've let's, got uh, let's, let's a big a screen up. up on my. How about, how about on my, is that better? Yeah, let me get the big screen shot in a, in a horizontal. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my gosh, that looks so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Well, all right, good, good. It's. Uh, that was I got a couple screenshots too. Thank you. Okay, well, you bet. Was that Kathy? Uh, that's me. <laughs> good. Somebody's been stealing screenshots as I go along, huh? Is that what's going on? That's a good idea. I hadn't. I hadn't thought about that. I, huh. I was planning to do some screenshots as you went along, and I just got so wrapped up in watching that I forgot until just now. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'll, uh, I'll get this uh, up online on our YouTube channel uh, by Monday. And then you guys will, when I send it out the next invitation, I'll be able to be able to go ahead and see that on YouTube. We've got a lot of YouTube 
customers now that have come in and started watching our videos, which is really nice. Well, I'd like, I'd uh, like to recognize, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I had a question just a, a little bit off topic, but I had a, was talking with a friend the other day about different threads. And I know that you use Danville and I was wondering if you could just speak a moment about what the properties you like about Danville. <clears throat> yeah, we like Danville. I've been using it for almost close to 50 years. No, I'll say 40 years and 50 years and make it back into the 60s. And I can't remember what I was using back that far. I started using Danville in the early 80s, late 70s and early 80s. And I haven't switched. And I like the way it lays. Uh, I, can, I can turn it into a single strand floss just by counter spinning when I need to. And it, I got to tell you, most of the size 20 flies that require floss, they never see any floss for me. They get thread. As, as, as a body you know, and, and that's all you need if you if you can lay down a good even thread base uh, you'll never know it wasn't done with floss colors the colors are good colors good, are good, good they're, colors. they're consistent all the time and it doesn't squeak oh yeah uni uni is a great thread but all the darn stuff would squeak at me as it would as a, as i'd wrap it around the hook it just drove me nuts i <laughs> I, I, I i forget the guy, a French sounding name, he contacted us when we were in Bozo and wanted us to get to using their uni thread. And, okay, we'll give it a try. I, I got a whole, got back with the guy, I said, that stuff squeaks at me. I just can't stand it. Do you know what? So we, tying all day, it makes a I difference. Mean, when you're tying all day, squeaking thread mm -hmm. gets me graded on your nerves. Do you know what causes that squeak? Uh, I have no idea. But somebody a lot smarter than me probably knows. <laughs> <clears throat> all I know is that it's probably, see, the Danville is a, a thread that will lay flat, and the Uni is a thread that mostly stays round. It's probably braided in some way, but I have no idea. And somebody that uses Uni, can you guys answer? Okay. I well, used to use, yeah, I, I used to use a lot of Uni, and I've gone to Danville quite a bit. And I, I was just curious what the the, the, uh, other thing, that, the other thing, the other thing we do, with, with the other thing we do, John, is all of our materials. We we go for consistency in our materials because we're commercial tires, and we want to produce a fly today the same as we did thirty years ago, and we still have customers from that far back coming coming back to get flies, and that's why we pick a certain color and shading of the animal hides that we get. We use certain thread. Um, we use certain dubbings. All of those things uh, go towards consistently producing a fly the same year in and year out. The only thing I have noticed, and there's a not a darn thing I can do about that, and it don't have anything to do with materials. But as I get older, the last couple of years, it's getting harder and harder to produce a consistent fly that's as good as the ones I did 15 years ago. So I have to admit that age is starting to get me. Not a hell of a lot I'm going to do about that, folks. I hate to tell you. Well, Ron Geyer just said he just takes his hearing aids out. <laughs> takes, aids out. takes the hearing aids out so he doesn't hear the squeak. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh, I'm going to remember that. What, what was this guy's name? Ron Geyer. He's one of our club members. Oh, Ron there, Geyer. There I, I don't have that problem. I just put my hearing aids on. Oh, Ron. <laughs> Ron, I, I may end up quoting you on that one of these days. You never know. I love it. That's good. <laughs> yeah, we're having fun with it. That's for sure. Well, yeah. if there isn't any more questions, uh, I'd like Gretchen to talk to us a little bit about your presentation next Thursday. Oh, let's see. I'm doing Lime True. Is yeah. that correct? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm going to be doing a lime trude, and, and what my plan is is to do um, a regular lime trude to start out with using calf tail, the whole shebang, and then um, I will tie a second fly using um, poly yarn for the wing so that some people who have trouble with calf might want to tie with poly for a while. However, after you learn how to use cap, I find that it really 
is easier um, in some ways than, than poly. So we'll we'll spend some time talking about calf tail and how to make it easier and what to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's pretty much the plan. It's also a good idea that find out when Steve gets his 10,000 calf tails in from Turkmenistan or wherever the heck it is <laughs> uh, to take a drive over to Lander, Wyoming and number one fish the Popoji River and number two to get get a get the cream of the crop of the, of the I, tails. I guess I'm doing a royal trude, not a green or lime trude, aren't I? You're doing a royal trude, yeah. Okay. I'm yeah. doing a royal trude. <laughs> yes. Or you so we'll talk a little bit about uh, peacock <clears throat> too, which is one of my favorite uh, favorite materials. So oh, good. I'll probably use moose for the tail. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, I just thought you could get calf tail in the U.S. <laughs> uh, they they can, but I just I was stunned to find that that out. We just we just happened to be talking to Steve one one day, or maybe we were there. Maybe it was the same time that. No, it was, we were talking on the phone. I, oh, I was thinking it was the time that I was sitting in that pile of trimmings. Oh. <laughs> yeah, with Gretchen. Oh, man. When they put all this stuff into the three by five packages, not everything fits in a three by five package. Sometimes there's a little triangle off on this side or a little strip over here, and all that ends up in the trash pile. I mean, it was moose, it was elk, it was deer. She was just up to her armpits and hair. You could not believe. Oh, that, God. Oh, there was calf body hair. She died and went to heaven. She was, it's yeah. almost as much fun as at Whiting Farms. When I worked there, she'd call and say, you want to go to lunch? That was code for she was getting into the bin set when she got back. <laughs> you never knew. What, <laughs> I mean, well, anyhow, no reason God, to get I'm into almost, that. I used a lot of that stuff. I, a whole bunch of it <clears> I used for, for, teaching so that you can have a little square of stuff some good stuff oh, yeah, to, yeah. To, to each one of the uh, students and i think i've just about this this trip to key largo is just about going to use up my I get rid of all that stuff yeah yeah it's a we, that's we, a lot of years yeah no kidding <clears throat> Gretchen, yeah. when you uh, talk about calf tail i hope you can talk to the effects of good calf tail and bad calf tail yep. and what section of the calf tail you're actually cutting the fibers from i wonder if we have any bad calf tail would be fun to show one i don't, I don't know. know we'll have to we'll look. have to look and see we hide maybe i'll them. mail one to you oh, <laughs> oh okay and please do john if we can have it by if we can or have you it could by just this. hold it up and show us there you too. go let's do it let's do a tight shot you can you can show a bad calf tail and we'll, we'll go from there that was another one of my favorite things at the fly tackle dealer that it was is that northwest american fly oh america anyway it's a supplier to shops and to tires and they have that's where i bought the elk hide but they also always always had a bin of calf tails and they let me go in there and high grade them i just couldn't <clears> believe <throat> it and i would buy you know a couple dozen every year yeah because when we were trying commercially, we went through a lot. It was dangerous taking me to that show. Yeah, it was expensive. <laughs> and it wasn't a trip. <laughs> well, uh, I guess as a tire, you have, uh, you're just really, really excited about good materials. And even if you don't need it, and you're in a fly shop, and you go, oh, that's Gretchen. Oh, yeah. I actually started tying because of materials. When I was a girl, my dad tied. He didn't tie with hair though, but he had he tied with, of course, uh, a lot of uh, ostrich, all colors of ostrich, a peacock, um, <coughs> a lot of um, pheasant, and oh, we still have. Um, Did you use waxed or unwaxed? We have a can full of. Uh, duck quills don't we yeah it's that right. go back clear back to the 40s of my my dad's stuff the only thing that he didn't have that was good was the um hackle but i used to sit beside him and size hackle and sort hackle for him when he was tying that's a bunch of 50 year old uh mallard flank oh look at that yeah it was a, it was a five gallon bucket that was full and we've used on it since her dad gave it to us and it was 40 years old then or, or well, 30 think, years old or whatever probably he harvested those himself too because he was a hunter so those were 
But anyway, that's what's left out of a, you know, a five gallons shoved full of mallard flank is quite a few feathers. My sisters thought I was out of my mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I did too, and I'm sure glad she had the same crazy, the cra same crazy streak that I did. Yeah. Well, you guys are terrific, and boy, I sure do thank you for the, the uh, all the work you've done to make all these images so clear. I mean, because I put this, put it up on this big screen and it's so clear, every wrap and the zoom in of the camera so you can see the wraps themselves. That's really, really, really useful. It was a little daunting for me at first to um, have everybody see exactly what I was doing. <laughs> I don't know if you all know who Tim Flagler is, but he's the guy that does probably the premier stuff on um, on YouTube, uh, Tightline Productions, and and he does a lot of stuff for Orvis and does stuff with Orvis. Anyway, he was at the Boise show, and we sat and talked for for quite a while. And he says, "You know what's the worst thing about Zoom?" I says, "What's that?" He says, "Everybody can see every teeny weeny mistake <laughs> you made. You know, when they're exactly. sitting across the three foot table from you, and they're you basically cover it you'd cover it up. They you can't can hide stuff. Can't. Yeah, but when you when you zoom in, like I mean, like this." when you zoom in like this it's pretty dang hard to i made some pretty bad snips there that don't look very good actually i got some hair trapped in the hackle oh my god you know that's the kind of stuff we're talking about it's uh you, you get by with a lot less you know with me as my skills de diminish and the uh, zoom gets in closer and closer it's a tough job let me tell you <laughs> Yeah, I realized that when I bought my macro lens and I thought, wow, that fly looks really good. And then I zoomed in to take a picture it, of it and I go, oh, hey, I got to do that over. <laughs> so, well, I really appreciate your time tonight and all the prep it takes to do this. And we had, we had um, uh, 26 people here tonight. Good. Yeah. So uh, good we job. don't get so many on. We don't get so many in the evening of the actual event, but we're just picking up another uh, between 150 and 200 more people on Facebook, and the, the, oh. and I and it's hard to tell just how many views we get on a particular video. I haven't figured out how to figure it out, but on YouTube we get we get a lot a lot more views than we used to. At least that's what YouTube is telling me on the reports that I get from every month. You don't live stream. You don't stream to Facebook, huh? No. Do you have a Facebook account? Oh yeah, yeah. Because you, you... we got 160 views last week on yeah. Friday night. You, yeah, see, you might want to think about it. If you if you want, I'll give you a hand getting set up. Oh, except for you want to. I think we might do that. I've got a little over a thousand Facebook friends, and uh, I and I've uh, been very very good at. Um, socializing that all we're doing is fly tying and fly fishing, no politics. And it's a pretty, pretty clean group that uh, yeah, we're all doing the same thing. Depends on what your goal is for your, your, your group. Do you want to kind of keep it just to your group or do you want to? No, not when you got over a thousand people tuning in. It's kind of, yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> and that's there are a, a lot point. of them from other countries now. By the way, I wanted to bring everybody's attention to the fact that Paul Fidelis from Port Macquarie, Australia, was on tonight, and and that's that you're drawing people from Australia, Sherry. Well, I think it's great, and I I want everybody to share these links, and reach out to anybody that that you want to to share that link. It's it's not uh, private. It's there for mm -hmm. everyone to learn from and keep keep the cards and letters coming with the comments on doing this better and better all the time but it's a learning curve with the technology we're all working in the same direction which is very sure. helpful gosh compared to where we last we were last year <laughs> we we started uh, we did al and uh, i have my little box of i don't use this anymore <laughs> yeah it's like the, the trying this and that and that's what it takes when you develop new technology and uh, and people are giving us a break. The saying, you know, if it's not perfect, then they're, they're saying, well, you could do. 
and that all those suggestions i want everybody to keep their cards and letters coming mm -hmm. and let's keep mm -hmm. learning more and more about this full deal because it looks like it's going to be around a while yeah it's the, it's the it's the new direction whether whether everybody goes with it gets with the program or whether you have to bring them in kicking and screaming and one of the things that I wanted to, one of the things that I talked with Tim Flagler about is um, John Kreft, I wanted to recognize you as a person who does one hell of a good Zoom presentation. Yeah, you do beautiful work, John. Um, oh, thank you. The way you, the way you intermix uh, uh, PowerPoint and your website and all that stuff, uh, hey, right on. I appreciate yeah. that. Hey, this, yeah. this whole thing forced me to buy a new camera, though. Oh, yeah. you didn't need much to get you to do hey, that. I've been looking at the one you've got. You've got the Z50, right? Oh, man, I'll tell you, I, I'm looking at a, another one, but this is done, doing such a good job. I, Karen isn't isn't here, so as long as she doesn't watch this, I probably don't need another camera, <laughs> but I sure want one. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm looking. I want to get Al's I'm, fault because he, he started me several years ago on a use 5100 and i'm just going to send you a bill for all i could show you a picture of all the lenses i have here i just John, ordered a new lens too i'm waiting for you're in you're in good hands and the yeah, check's in the yeah. mail yeah exactly <laughs> check is in the mail <laughs> yeah all right hey, i just i just um posted two new youtube videos too of the flies i tied last week so if you don't okay. want to go through all this is just the tying the flies. So it's the Iobo Humpy and that CDC loop wing and merger. And I think the the resolution is probably a little bit better than what it is here on Zoom. Sure. All right. I'm gonna go, guys. Thank thank you, Al. Thank you, Gretchen. I've got I've got to go. All right, I've thank you. Go. I gotta go uh, too. Share. My booster shot. Uh oh. Have fun. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Good night, everybody. Hey, good night, everyone. Thank you. Good Thank night. You. Thank you. Take care now. See you next week. You bet. Bye-bye.